saints And I'm so in love with you For what you've done for me Here I am to worship you Without any restraint You're the only way, the truth And life that makes me You're listening to Spiritual Encounters with Pastor Casper McLeod. And now, here's your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper. Welcome to another edition of Spiritual Encounters, and I am your lion-hearted host, Pastor Casper, here with my dear friend and co-host, Pastor Brandon Gallops, and our producer Barry Richard hiding in the background but really excited don't touch that dial because we've got Richard Shaw who doesn't really need an introduction at this point friend of spiritual encounters over the years the co-producer of the watchers and the Torah codes and a host of other film projects Richard welcome back to spiritual encounters what's going on in your world oh thanks Casper it's great to be here again with all of the distinguished guests on the show <laughs> well Let's just jump right in there. There's like strange stuff going on. Brandon and I um, were just at the Hear the Watchman conference and you know, just kind of tuning in again with everyone. All the, the None of the speakers actually coordinate what we're going to say, right? Um, Carl Gallup's starting us off as usual. Um, this, this last book like explains it all, right? There's something going on, invisible wars going on, cosmic wars and you're right in the midst of it with all your research over the years, especially with what you shared on the watches. Um, so how how were these fallen angels able to reproduce with human women? I mean, is this like genetic gene splicing that similar to what they're discovering today? Is something else going on? What do you think? Uh, are, is that a question to which one of us? To, to you, yes. To me. You're, you're, you're in the hot seat. You're the guest. Okay, uh, no, no problem. I think that, well, uh, that's a difficult question because I think it started out one way and turned into something else later on after after a few millennia went by. I think originally, by everything I've read in the Book of Enoch and the Bible and everything else, that it was a bunch of angels that were attracted to the women because the women were very fair. And they came down here and had actual sex with them. Well, they didn't expect to have what actually happened afterwards, where our, basically our genetics weren't compatible and these giants appeared upon the earth. And, and this, what most people feel is a so-called myth about the giants is really true because in, in our studies, this, the stuff that L.A. and I have done all over the world – there is a major cover-up at almost every place we've ever been to not show the truth about the giants and that they actually existed. And here's some of the stuff they built. And, it, you know, when you start taking the Bible as a literal piece of historical manuscript and you start taking it in that regard, then these things become uh, a lot more real to you. But what I think is fascinating about all of it is that there are good angels and bad angels and it, it doesn't matter whether they're good or bad. They still have specific abilities and I guess you'd call it powers. Um, we'd call it powers because we don't know what else to, to call it as, but apparently they're telepathic and they can get into your head and all of those kind of things. And this is also quite evident uh, on the ones that are doing alien abductions and all that. And I, I know we're getting, we're going into a, like a fringe area here for a lot of people, but this stuff is real. And now, as far as building hybrids and doing what your question was, Casper, I think before in the early days when this first happened, it was a, a natural occurrence of mixing their sperm with human women 
now it's much more uh, concealed and secretive and basically done in ways that use genetics and science. I mean, as crazy as this sounds, and what I try to do is be very factual and as scientific as I can be in these explanations so I don't sound like I've lost my mind, but I know people, several people, that have been abducted and continue to be. And I recently uh, interviewed Steve, Steve Colburn, who was uh, Dr. Roger Lear, who was a really great friend of ours, the, the guy who was the world expert on alien implants. Uh, Steve was his chief scientist for a number of years. And you might remember that Implant 17 was our guy, Emil, that wanted his implant removed. Well, Implant 15 has now been revealed it was Steve Colburn's implant. And Steve had an implant in his toe, but he still has implants in his head. You can verify this with an X-ray. He has an implant, a metallic implant behind each ear and a non-metallic implant in the center of his brain. Now, those are things we can't do without killing somebody, but they know how to do it. What can you describe the implants for those that may not know what we're talking about? These were analyzed and then not something you would find on Earth. Well, exactly. An implant, or at least what are referred to as alien implants, are, are basically... Uh, very tiny pieces of metal that are injected under the skin in various places, leaving no visible port of entry after they're done, no scarring or anything like that. They tend to grow a gray capsule around them that's sometimes filled with a, a liquid that keeps the actual implant uh, safe inside of this little cocoon but it allows human nerve endings to grow through that substance and attach themselves to the implant inside, okay? Once that occurs, the implant then takes on certain characteristics. It, it generates a magnetic flux about it, anywhere from 6 to 10 milligauss, which can be measured with a uh, flux density meter that you can, it's basically a little device that has a needle on it and it makes a crazy noise when you're putting it near something that's magnetized. Um, since they're metal, they can be picked up with a, the old faithful Home Depot stud finder because all that device does is look for metallic objects that you can't see that's behind, like in a wall, like a nail or something. It'll find them with that. But then the implants also put out a radio frequency now, this is way up in the, like, 300 megahertz range. I mean, way, way high frequency. At, at one time, we thought it was 300 gigahertz until we realized we think that Roger was misreading his meter. And I got a call from Professor Herlich saying, if it really is 300 gigahertz, it would start burning his skin because now you're working in the microwave, you know, area. So this is how scientific we've gotten. So the ones that have been removed, we've done optical microscopy, which is putting it under an optical microscope, usually a stereo microscope where you can see it in 3D, and then you can see at least the surface of what the implant looks like, but we need more in-depth study of it, so normally what we do after that is we put it under SEM, which is the scanning electron microscope, usually make a cut uh, with an exacto knife or something so that we can get to the interior of it and look at it under the, the microscope. And when you're using an electron microscope, it the part that you're looking at is put into a vacuum chamber and all the oxygen is pumped out. And once that happens, then it you can enlarge it several thousand times. And the, you have a cursor on the screen where you can tell... Uh, what you want to examine and you put the cursor over a specific area and then you can get what is called an EDX readout 
and I know this sounds really technical, but I'm just trying to tell you there's no BS here. We're doing this very scientifically. The the EDX, it, it's basically energy dispersant X-ray spectroscopy. And it, what it allows you to do is find out what elemental compounds are in the, the sample that you're looking at. And normally what we've discovered is that the implants are uh, a large part iron and nickel, sometimes titanium, uh, other trace elements, oxygen, and then if you happen to hit a piece of a nerve ending, you have 99% carbon because carbon is like skin. So this is what we find repeatedly in these tests. Uh, in the one that's in Watchers 8, where we removed Emil's implant, um, Steve took some tweezers and took the little uh, skin of it off. And that went to a pathology lab to examine it basically for any, um, any problems like infection or inflammation, and none was detected. So it had been in, in Emil's leg for 40 years, and it never generated any infection or inflammation. So that's where you go with these things. We think that they're using them as a communication device. We think that there's some of them have nanotube and nanosphere uh, technologies in them, like they're little computers built inside of these implants, and they can do bi-directional communication with them. As I think you had said um, to me ages ago that Dr., the late Dr. Roger Lear, your friend, had said, when you asked him, what are these things doing? Why are they putting them in? And he said, ah, they're changing DNA. Um, and then we look at the 666, you know, in, in the scriptures, um, uh, Revelations 13, it's you know, telling 12, carbon 12 is like being the most um, abundant element in the universe. Uh, it's presented in all forms, carbon-based life. So um, we consider for a moment uh, human bodies. We're contained, right? The carbon um, 12 is also um, in us, right? So we got carbon 12, right. but, um, six, well, protons, there's... six neutrons and six electrons, right? So okay. what, what's going on with all that? I, I think that the idea of them changing human DNA was L.A.'s idea. But we presented that to Roger because L.A. is looking for a reason to help better understand uh, what it says in the Bible that you know, once you get these implants, that's pretty much it. You're you're changed. You're you're like um, uh, I, I, the scripture that I'm hunting for here doesn't come to to mind immediately. But I know, like he was looking to see if that's what what might happen here. And and I've well, talked to him before. Those days we shorten, but there'd be no flesh saves. But luckily, right. those days we shorten. So that's what you're talking about here. Yeah, the only thing that, and I've talked to LA about this before, and and we have great arguments together. <laughs> but but I said, okay, but what about then when in Revelation it said, and people brought broke out in grievous sores that had the the mark. Well, if you have an alien implant, that doesn't happen. So I don't think that people are going to get that kind of technology during the end of days. I think it's, I think we've learned from it, but we're not advanced at that stage to make something that can grow its own skin. That is really sophisticated technology to do something like that. Well, I don't think we have across, that. There are people that are coming to us at these conferences and talking about synthetic, you know, people's synthetic skin, um, Brandon, what, what's your take on this, Pastor Brandon? Well, I, you know, I think that obviously we have to be really careful about declaring anything to be, well, this is the mark, because uh, obviously that's what we're all sitting here referencing, you know. Um, and, 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 you know, the way that I read that and understand it, and I certainly don't have the final interpretation on it, let me be very clear. Um, you know, this is when we, when we start talking about this mark uh, that will eventually come, that will be required of all people to buy and sell and trade. It seems to me on my reading and understanding, this is going to be something that's taken 
voluntarily by people. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, I can think of scenarios in my mind where people would obviously line up to do that. Um, but I would have a hard time wrapping my head around that being from a alien implant. Uh, you know, I mean, look, we have all of the technologies available right here on the face of the earth uh, today through RFIDs, through biometrics. Um, I, my personal opinion, I think biometrics is going to play into the marking system. Uh, I, well, I, I tend to agree with you. I mean, I've heard that, you know, Siemens technology from Europe has already yeah. made like a, a billion of these chips. Yeah, and, and and so, you know, I mean, UN Agenda 2030, they're openly announcing that by 2030, they want to biometrically, quote, mark the entire planet. Um, Israel was the first nation on the face of the earth to go to a biometric uh, ID system, and, and, for, and it was mandatory for 18 and over in, in, in Israel. So, you know, when you see Israel do that, it's the first nation to do it. I think we better pay attention to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's totally. It's a great point. I mean, are you guys have you been following the the uh, so-called global currency reset? I'm not familiar with that. No, sir. Um, there, there is this, and I know guys who are really involved with it and who are believers. And the people that have gotten into this are 80 percent of them Christian, <laughs> and. The reason I'm intrigued by it is because I think it, it's it's very possible that this is going to happen soon, this year sometime. And what that means is that basically, uh, you remember what got JFK killed was trying to get rid of the Federal Reserve. Uh, yeah, right. absolutely. Well, the Federal Reserve is broke. Yeah. Yeah. And Trump is basically working on doing the same thing. And so China and Russia, from what we've heard and read over the past year, have converted to an asset-backed currency, meaning gold. And there's other com countries that are also going to do that, including the U.S. And we're, we're going from a different kind of currency from the Federal Reserve note to, I think they're going to call it the U.S., TN, United States Treasury note. And it will be gold backed and it will look different than the current bills that we have. But we're working, uh, the world is working feverishly in the bankings. The central bankers are, of the world are working feverishly on a non physical cash system. It will be all electronic. And we, we're kind of used to that with credit cards that have implanted chips in the cards and all of that. You go into the store and you stick it in the machine. And it now it, it used to take a long time for it to read it. Now it's just like instantly, okay? And uh, Casper, wasn't the Netherlands uh, involved in in getting chipped? People wanted to get chipped there. They were wanted Sweden, to experiment. Sweden, most yeah. of the people in Sweden yeah. involved being chipped. I heard like 5,000 people were doing it. They wanted yep. to try it out. They're volunteering. They can't, can't do it quick enough. Yeah. 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 And there's companies here in the United States that are already offering that for their employees as a way to access, uh, you know, different areas. Uh, I think if I remember right, Ohio, a big company in Ohio uh, is doing that right here in the United States. And people are lining up to get it done. Well, well have, you ever, have you ever seen an RFID chip? I've held one in my hand, so I know what it looks like. Have you guys seen one up close? I have not. No. It looks like a little bit like a like a fat grain of rice in size. It's made out of glass. It has a coil of wire of copper wire, really fine copper wire wrapped on the inside, and inside of that is a small circuit, integrated circuit of some sort. And the way it works is that. Uh, you know what RFID stands for? It's radio frequency identification. And the way they do that is when, when you walk through a terminal, then this coil in, induces a current which turns on the electronics. Because anytime you get a coil of wire in a magnetic field, it generates electricity. So that's how the thing is powered. There's no batteries in it or anything like that. It, it's self-powering. It's like your electric toothbrush. You know, when you put it in the charger, 
There's no physical wires. You go, how's this thing charging? It's because there's a coil of wire in the post that goes up the middle of your toothbrush, and then there's a an O-ring coil inside of the, the toothbrush body. And when you put them together and the, the two parts stick together, you've ended up with an AC transformer. Well, that's kind of how this thing works, too. So um, what that will do the chip will be smart enough to have all of your banking information, the kind of your last purchases at the store, most likely your, the things that you normally buy. And it will almost be like you could, as these things get better, I would imagine you could walk through the store and there would be monitors up there showing you specials and all the things you like, because it would basically track you through the store. You mean like Google, you mean like Google does now? Yeah, but I mean, it would be more, you know, yep. it would it, it would it's tied to your DNA and what they'll do. I think what they're going to say is, OK, look, we've had so much trouble with fraud, credit cards getting hacked. Um, you know how they hack a lot of credit cards is that gas pumps. They have readers now that get your pin number and they basically can make a new credit card, uh, put your pin number in it put your name on it and everything, and then go use it somewhere. I've had that happen to me, okay? Had to have my number changed and all of that. So they're going to tell everybody, this will end all of that. Well, we know that's not true because you can hack into anything. It's just a matter of time until it's hacked. But people will want that because there will be no physical currency and the only way you can spend any money is to use your chip. That's why the Bible says you can't buy and sell. It also yeah. tells us that there's you know days coming when there will arise false Christ and false prophets and great signs and wonders, and if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. So um, we've got the smart dust and the nano uh, chips, nanobots, um, reading that stuff in with the chemtrails, Little tiny computers now, you know, invading. Uh, is it possible they're going to be using some kind of weapon like the the voice of God weapon? All of a sudden, people hear a, a voice in their head saying, um, "Accept the new world order, or everything will be really groovy," you know. And you go, <laughs> "Okay." And then all these, these nanobots that you've breathed in over the last number of years kick in and change the DNA, and you, you're no longer human. Oh, that's freaky. No, I I mean, all <laughs> these things are like. I mean, we're talking about science here. I mean, we're talking about nanotechnology. We don't know the extent of how far they've gone with it, but I know that Honeywell makes nanotubes and, and buggy balls, and people buy these things and experiment with them. And, you know, if we've basically maxed out what we can do with silicone chips and because they generate heat. They require a lot of power. And if we got down to where we're using nanocomputers – I mean, we're talking computers that you could put my whole Mac Pro on the head of a pin and probably still have more <laughs> more storage than I've got now. Because you're talking at the atomic level here. Well, it's kind of like the way God created um, the neurons in our brain. I mean, we could you can store an entire college course on one neuron. Or, yeah, or one. and, and that's, this is why we have to be changed. It's going to become a requirement or we won't be able to cope with this. And Jesus knows that, but we weren't ready for it before. I've had kind of an epiphany this past year. All this stuff where we learn in churches and we're kind of browbeaten, well, this is because there was sin and these people did this and they did that. And it's like, I think the Bible's just explaining, well, this is going to happen. Uh, and when you really get down to it, it's because it has to happen this way. Stuff like this is going to happen. It's not like it's, of course, yeah, the way its usage is evil, but yeah, you won't be able to buy or sell uh, as if there's someone with their gun to your head. I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's just a, a statement of fact. You won't be able to buy and sell. Well, now we know why, because if, if the money goes completely electronic, Unless you have some way to access it, you can't buy and sell. It's impossible, right. right? So it's a statement of fact. And, and we sometimes we, we get into this thing where we, we're browbeating people like they're stupid or like they're sinners. you know. And it's like, wait a minute. The Bible is just trying to tell us 
what's happening. That's why the Bible is so super cool, because it's telling us what happens in the future, and there's no other book that we know of that can do that. So we just have to look at all of this stuff with fresh eyes, with a, an understanding of the technologies that is happening now. And we need to be up on all this stuff as best we can and realize that this isn't a conspiracy theory. This stuff's real. Yeah. This stuff's really happening. It, it's interesting, Richard, what you said a couple of minutes ago about how this type of technology could be brought into mainstream. Uh, you know, because where well, your financial records could be hacked or stolen or, or, or your bank account could be hacked. Here's a way to stop that. And immediately this scripture came to mind. First Thessalonians 5, 3. While people are saying peace and safety, safety. destruction will come upon them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Now, think about all of the technologies of the day that are being sold to us through peace and safety. Yes, technologies like microchips and biometrics even already. You know, well, well, you can log into your cell phone with an iris scanner. Uh, you can, brother, I was in Guatemala uh, several years ago on a mission trip and in a remote part of the country where we were told that we were the first white people in this particular village they had ever seen. They would not exchange our American money in the little thing that they called a bank there because they didn't want it. Who doesn't want U.S. dollars, right? But the love were walking in this same bank and using their thumbprint to deposit and withdraw money in the jungles of Guatemala. OK, yeah, it's amazing. So my, my, yeah, my, my point being, all of the technologies of the day, biometrics, RFID, genetic editing, gene editing, CRISPR Cas9 splicing, all of this stuff is being sold to us as peace and safety. Genetic editing is being sold to us as you will never have to worry about having a child born with this specific disease or this specific ailment or this specific birth defect again. And here's the reality. The technology is there to prevent that, but who's controlling those technologies? The technology in and of itself is not evil. Biometric technology in and of itself is not evil, but it's the people that are controlling it and what we will do with it and where it will go that will eventually turn it into being used for evil, of course. Sure. And, you know, it's, 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 well, once it's, once it starts, you won't be able to put the genie back in the bottle again. Pandora's box. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it basically will change everything. And this is why I thought it was, you know, I'm studying about the Ark of the Covenant and all of the, uh, the ideas of where it might be, and Casper knows this, I've been working on a project called Project X-Ray now for several years, and we're getting leads on stuff like this. But one one of the interesting things uh, was, you guys have probably heard of Ron Wyatt. Of course. He, who said he found the Ark in January of 1982. Mm -hmm. He described the chamber it was in and all that. But, you know, some of this I'm going... Okay, you know, well, then why is it, you know, I was really skeptical. But then I really analyzed what he was saying. He said that there were angels around the ark, and he had trouble staying conscious at the time. So I'm thinking, okay, we know that is a reality. Anytime you're with those kind of beings, they are dealing with you telepathically, and it's usually too much for our heads. Yeah, you know, all of the scriptures, you know, where Peter was in jail and, you know, got rescued and all of the guards got switched off like that. And when people are, are abducted by aliens, the same thing happens to them. They don't they can only remember part of their experience. They go unconscious immediately. They only remember what they're allowed to remember. And all of this is like missing it's, time. Yeah, missing time, all of these things that happen, all these attributes that happen. These things are real. These people have actually had these experiences. I look at them as the Bible has have basically given us a heads up on all of this activity that these beings are just telepathic. So, okay, next, let's just accept that as being fact. They're telepathic. So that means that the closer they get to you, the more you're affected by that. And I actually asked Dr. David Jacobs once, 
if that was the case. He said, you're the only person that's ever asked me that. And he said, it's a great question. And he said, yes. He said, the closer these aliens get to someone, the more they're affected by this mental telepathy thing. They'll be watching TV and they suddenly are realizing they're getting sleepy and they nod off and they don't remember anything after that. You and, and, and Alain Marzulli have said um, over the years that these are most likely interdimensional beings. They're not somebody that came millions and millions of light years away from another galaxy, as uh, Sir Richard Dawkins um, you know, propagates uh, the panspermia idea. So we're, you know, if it looks like a dog, walks like a duck, swims like a duck, probably a duck. These then tend to, to line up with what we would call demons. So we got these little gray um, uh, creatures that are showing up and you've dealt with a lot of cases over the years researching this thing and with hardcore physical scientific evidence. Where, where are these grays? Are they like demons and drag? I mean, what's going on here? <laughs> You know, I actually, I think, and, and I talked about this with Steve. I said, Steve, L.A. and I have a theory about the grays. Uh, I, I want your opinion on it. And and I said, because he's seen them, and he's interacted with them on ship when they take him up there. And I said, what do they do when you're up there? He said, they give me an assignment. And he's a scientist, so he knows what's going on. And he said, they've got people that they're working on all over inside the ship with this hybrid technologies. That they're, I mean, there's people being changed in these ships and we don't know what happens to them afterwards david jacobs thinks that they're reintroducing our civilization our population and they look like us so there's really no way to tell who's who okay unless you did a, some dna testing which is really really crazy but i said la and i have this theory that the grays are clones and he goes you're probably right he said because they have no genitalia there's no way for them to reproduce, and their skin is almost like uh, it's lizard-like. It's it's kind of reptilian. They're not reptilians per se, as we know. You know, they don't have alien. They don't have reptile heads, lizard eyes, and all the stuff that you see in pictures. But they do have skin that is weird, and that skin has a seepage that comes off of it. It has like a uh, well, I don't know if it's sweat glands or whatever, but they have, they leave a residue behind when they touch things and you can, that residue, uh, can be picked up by UV light. Uh, if you're touched on your arm, if they've touched a wall or any object in your house and you have a ultraviolet light, you can go in there and look at and just see where they've been well, because you the, the stuff happen. comes up. I mean, the watchers, you reveal handprints on the wall and other areas. Yeah. It was like, was it three fingers? Uh, it it, like well, it's like it's four fingers, and, they, and the fingers have like little pads on the ends. Like, well, not suction cups, but they're, they're enlarged on the ends. We know a lot about these, these creatures. I mean, they, they're, they totally exist. I mean, in that film that I did on the Combergas UFO, you can see them. I mean, there they are. I mean, they're on camera. I was just going to ask you that. I mean, you figured out, the Holy Spirit directed you the, the, the look at the time delineation. You, Dr. Roger Lear gave you some actual footage. You were able to see into the craft. Um, maybe you can just, I know you, you filmed that in the watches, but for people that haven't seen it or maybe need to be reminded of what um, the experience was maybe you can shout a bit of that. Oh yeah, I put it all up on on Vimeo on my Vimeo channel. You, you can watch it for free. But it's basically because I want people to know that this this isn't fakery. We're not doing this in some 3D program or anything like that. This is like actual video taken of a craft that hit, was hanging over the same spot of, over the Sea of Marmara in Camburgas, Turkey, for three years in a row. They were expecting it. <laughs> they all got ready. People got out on the beach and sat there. It was like a show. <laughs> and so they got the camera out, and um, they're still having sightings there, but nothing like what we've seen in the past like this. But basically, the ship had, had a couple openings, portals. portals, yeah. And we could see, clearly see three aliens, and there was something else in the shadows behind jumping around and 
and they might have been working on an abductee. It's the only thing we can figure. But uh, the first time I saw it, it was so blurry and fuzzy and and jittery, almost like static. And I thought, I wonder if you know. Every time people go on ships, they always say they've lost five hours of their life. They come home and it's like five hours later. What happens to that time? Well, so I slowed the the video way way down. And then all of a sudden, it looked almost normal. I mean, that you could see that they were turning their heads and looking at each other, and they were moving more in a realistic fashion. And all of this stuff that you see were in in all these clips all over the world where UFOs take off like super fast, make right angle corners, disappear. You know, you've physics. all seen this. Yeah, they all defy the laws of physics. And they're really not. It's because we're standing here on the Earth in our own time continuum, and they're floating above the Earth in their own time-space continuum, which is like 12 times faster than ours. So to them, they're just, they're not doing what it appears to us to be doing. We're looking like a film sped up when we watch them from the, from the ground, if that makes any well, sense at all. And, and if they truly are uh, beings from another dimension of reality, you know, angelic and fallen and angelic beings, as as we all believe, um, then, I mean, again, we can equate that back to scripture, that for the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The, the time frame in that realm is completely different than, than our 24-hour day, 365-day-a-year time frame that we live in. Uh, well, yeah, I think that's part of it. I think the other part of it is technology. Um, I, I know you guys are familiar with Bob Lazar, who is basically was worked at Groom Lake and Area 51 and basically went in there as a free thinker to try to analyze the craft they were showing him. And, and he said that basically the, these, these UFO ships develop almost like a toroidal shaped core of, of uh, anti-gravitational characteristics. It, it opposes the Earth's own gravitational field. And the, and the stronger that, that those lines of flux are, and it, it takes a lot of energy to do this, so much so that the bottom of the ship tends to end up having kind of a plasma develop, high voltage like arcing around on the bottom of the ship. And when you see this in a lot of UFO sightings, they glow, uh, they, they, they shed chunks of light as they're flying around through the space. And it's all of this high voltage stuff flying off, you know, from around the ship because they're generating so much energy. But the, the, when they turn it up all the way, then it no longer is in our time space continuum. It disappears essentially. It's like a cloaking device, so, so to speak. That's when the, the gravity field's turned all the way up. The ship just basically disappears. Now, whether that slides into another dimension or whether it's just cloaking itself from our, our visibility, I don't know. But I know that a lot of these ships are also only visible in the infrared spectrum, and they are indeed visible in infrared. If you have an in infrared camera, you can see them. And there's pictures on YouTube of guys, if you had an infrared camera, and you can see them flying information out in space. I mean, there they are. I had well, pictures of all this stuff. As you bring that up, um, perhaps you can elaborate. When you were in, in with Dr. Lear, the last uh, removal of the implant, and, and the device was, something was cloaking it. And so LA was prompted in front of all these secular scientists that were filming with you. Uh, maybe you can take that story and share that. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, basically, two weeks earlier, we had determined uh, exactly where the implant was in Bill's leg. And we had to do that in order to get over to Dr. Matriciano's office because that was the last stage before the actual surgery. So we used all of Roger's equipment, which is outlined in Watcher 7. You know, like I was saying, the, the stud finder and the Gauss meter and the uh, RF detection is essentially a frequency counter to see what kind of uh, radio frequencies it was emitting. And we did all of that, and then we had four x-rays that we did, and then we had a CAT scan. And a CAT scan basically slices 
uh, Bill's leg in, in cross sections so we could see exactly where it was. You know, it was near the tibia. It was near the top of the tibia. Um, and so we kind of knew where it was, but the last step was to, to do an ultrasound. So we went over to Dr. Matriciano's office and he did an ultrasound test and we found the thing like in a couple minutes. So then we said, okay, let's book a time to do the actual surgery because Dr. Lear wanted all his friends over there to watch. So when I found out he wanted to do that, I ran cables out into the lobby, set up a big HD monitor out there so they could see what was going on in the surgical room where we are because I didn't want all those people hanging out while we were trying to make a film. And also it's it's would drive the docs crazy, you know, trying to deal with all those people. So we're in there on the day of the surgery and uh, Dr. Matriciano turns on the in, uh, ultrasound device and we can't find the implant anywhere. So uh, Dr. Lear brought out his zipper bag full of all of his equipment and we all used it. I knew how it worked at that point, you know. In fact, I told Dr. Lear before he passed away, I said, I know so much about this because of what you've taught me. I could probably do this myself except for the surgery now. And, you know, he and he was like, he, he was so cool. You know, he, he taught me everything about it. And it's not rocket science. It's just like very physical. It's just like a, a part under your skin. And it's not like a nail from Home Depot. This is like something that really is meteoric in size and, and it came from space okay so anyway we used all of those devices and none of them worked the home depot stud finder detected metal everywhere on bill's leg <laughs> it was like what and then we tried the gauss meter and no matter where we put it on either leg it read zero now this is the same gauss meter I even changed the battery and I thought, well, maybe the battery's like wacky. So we put in a new nine volt battery in it and still nothing. Okay. Not possible that this could happen. So then we put the, you know, Dr. Matriciano had the, the goop on his leg to slide the, the little wand around that detects it. Nothing. We couldn't find it anywhere. So we were holding up the, the x-rays and, and Dr. Lear's using a bunch of, uh, really cool scientific terms to Dr. Matriciano, you know, to, to look up the scapula and look, you know, on the, the anterior surface of the tibia and, and follow that up and down until we could find the thing. Cause we knew kind of where it was. I mean, you know, and earlier, two weeks earlier, he had taken a felt tip marker and put an X on it, you know, well, it was gone. So then Steve Colburn said, well, maybe they came and got it they didn't want us messing with it, meaning the aliens came back and took it out while uh, Bill was sleeping or something. And there, then we started talking, well, could we get another x-ray? Is there anybody open on Saturday that where we could go just re-x-ray it and reestablish where it is? And we didn't, you know, by then it was like too late to do that. We had a whole crowd of people there and we had all our equipment set up. And so I'm kind of praying to myself, Lord, this needs to end now. I mean, we really need to get this done because we can't afford to set all this up again. I mean, this is like we want to get this thing out of Bill's leg. And then L.A. pipes in and goes, I'm this may be a little weird, but I'm, I'm going to say a prayer here. And he goes, Lord, we just pray that whatever's cloaking this thing, that you'd cause him to stop it and do it now. In but Jesus a, name. Yeah. And, and about a minute after he prayed that, I was shooting the monitor uh, for the ultrasound machine with my camera. It was the only I couldn't get a feed from the monitor, so I just shot it with my camera. All of a sudden, the implant just goes and dissolves in like an effect. <laughs> and I'm going, and I even you can hear my voice. I said, "What the heck is that?" Because we'd been looking at that same spot for an hour and fifteen minutes. And Dr. Lear goes, that looks like the real deal to me, you know, and there it was. It just became uncloaked. So we know they have this ability to do these things that is, it's freaky that they can do it. So this is why. At that point, just to write about that, uh, you know, it says, behold, I give unto you power over all the works of the enemy. Nothing shall many, many means harm you, right? So there it was. How they praised the Lord Jesus. And all of a sudden, this thing cannot hide any longer. Yeah, it's more. Jesus is more powerful than the fallen angels or any angel. 
course, the real angels would never do such a thing. And I think, I, you know, my wife Mary and I were talking about what's the idea with the fallen angels? Because it, it sounds so ancient, biblical, you know, and sometimes I hate using biblical terms because all of a sudden it, everything, people tag it as some Christian event. So then it has no credibility to an unbeliever because you're using Christian terms for everything. So the fallen angels, I, I told Mary, said, they probably saw them falling in these ships coming out of the ionosphere, leaving a trail or something, and coming down to the ground. How would you describe that 4,000 years ago? And then these guys get out, and they're possibly glowing, or they're, they don't look human. So they must be angels, right? If we if we saw an angel today, would we say it's an angel, or would we call it an alien? Because we're kind of like, through movies and everything, we're kind of conditioned to this stuff, to, to not really recognize what an angel might be, and yet there's some angels that probably list look like we do, but That's have awesome. abilities, that you know? A- yeah. And part of that Hegelian dialectic, you know, trying to get us all the, because of the programming and the films and the way it's being exactly. set up for the deception, Second Thessalonians. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're at a place where, you know, the time is going to come when when people won't into sound doctrine, right? Well, that day's happening. You know, the churches are filled with people wanting to um, find teachers, you know, with itching ears, right? To cotton candy kind of sermonettes, right? Just make yeah. it good. You come in with your sin issues, you leave with your sin issues. Nothing changes. Nobody's getting sanctified in those kind of environments. So the devil's basically offering GMO, um, you know, fast foods, and now he's offering GMO churches. He's infiltrated. And then um, just to comment on some things you've been saying here, um, we got the guy, Dr. Hansen with Sophia, the, the robot. I mean, uh, oh, yeah. like saying... Uh, with summoning demons, with D-wave computers, for those that don't know about D-waves, it's kind of like if you could harness 30, uh, was it, uh, 7 billion brains together, you know, like back in Genesis, it says, like, well, now nothing they imagined will be impossible, right? So what what is behind it? D-wave, is it the same thing that's inspiring things like Ouija boards? I mean, it's, just, it's summoning demons, right? And then oh, he's that's, that's about- interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I could see... I mean, that's an interesting, uh, yeah, you know, okay. hypothesis on the whole. I mean, look, these beings are real. And I don't know how to basically say that other than, They're real. You know, I don't, so uh, yeah, no I know. So let's just accept the fact yeah. that there are beings like this. I think there's a lot more people now that believe in, you know, extraterrestrial life, first of all. Well, wait, 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 hold it right there. I like when like, Derek Gilbert brought the forward for my last book, he showed the Barnapal showing more people are believing in the extraterrestrial than in the God of the Bible today. They're, they're expecting the extraterrestrial sure. to come save the world from destroying it, blowing itself up, right? Well, that, well, that came from Chris Putnam's uh, yeah. interview that we did with him where he said there's more people who believe in E.T. than believe in God. That's in Watcher 7. But what that what that came from, the origin of that comment was from a poll taken in the UK. That's where that came from. Because in the UK, church is dead. It's basically dead. No I one really... i back to you on that in just a matter of a few days. I'll be back in England, so... Um, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're going, because they need some help over there. Let's bring some life back into the church. Well, I mean, when we look at it, I mean, most Christians today have never led anybody into salvation. They haven't prayed for anyone to be healed. They haven't canceled any demons. Why is that? We've got the one, we're the ones with the answers, but the rest of them are running towards the, the New Age guys, right? The, the Burning Man, um, all these festivals, they're they don't make any restrictions. Just come, you know, do what I will, right? They just bring everybody and accept them the way they are. Well, the church I, wants to put restrictions. Well, wait a minute. You can't have uh, long hair. You can't dress like that. You can't dance. You can't sing. Whatever, right? Um, this is this is not the word of God. So, no, I, and I think the reason people have gravitated over to the New Age thinking. I mean, they believe in ascension. They're looking for 
uh, like the fourth dimension, you know, there, I mean, there's all this stuff, uh, the fifth dimension, excuse me. Right. I mean, there, there's all the this Dave stuff. Aquarius, right? When we were kids, right? The, the, the people singing the Dave Aquarius. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah. Great so, band. I mean, but but <laughs> <laughs> the, the thing is that um, we're, this isn't, we're entering something different. And a lot of it's incredibly evil. The fact that you can kill a newborn baby and no one and everyone cheer. Yeah. I mean that that just punches me right in the chest when I hear stuff that is really, yeah, well, really wicked. On that uh, that subject message. Um I mean you're right. I mean we, we are on the end of age here and things even the secular guys know something's coming. Something's about to change. Uh, the, the the you know transhumanist looking for the singularity, the moment when computers are self aware. Um, it was a Dr. Hansen who did Sophia, and he's saying things like, "Well, I, I want my robots to be, in, you know, to be distinguishable from humans." But in fact, I think that's not true. I think they want them to be indistinguishable from humans. And, yeah, and, yeah, and it won't be like like it, the good robots, like in Star Trek, like Commander Data or someone like that. You know, it, it's it, it, humans have never made uh, stuff that has that kind of of consideration towards others. I mean, it would be more like it. Oh, what's that movie with Matt Damon that came out? Uh, and and they had basically uh, a, a floating city in orbit around the Earth where all of the elites lived, and then everybody else and lived Elysium. on the planet. And Elysium. Thank you. And, but anyway, he got he got beat up by a robot, and 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 basically he had to go you know, show his credentials at a government office. It was all run by robots and the robot wouldn't listen to anything he's saying. It was all completely cold, completely metallic. To me, that's what I think the, the elites want. They don't care about us. They don't care about humanity. They just want to manage it like like our the late Chuck Misler used to say, we lived in a managed agenda. And that's that's really true, but just keep, to put, keep, it, keep put it neat. Keeping in mind, whatever the enemy is doing, whatever the devil's up to, God will always outmaneuver. And you're absolutely right. I, I showed in my lecture this weekend with the other watchmen, um, the, a group uh, uh, formed out of Russia Initiative 2045. They don't want to just um, make some changes. They want to completely redo the entire universe. They want to get away with, uh, destroy the body because then you can put your mind into artificial carriers and um, this is where the, I mean, they're seriously going towards this stuff. They're running towards it. Yeah. Well, to kind of uh, wrap what I was saying in a neat bow about the Ark of the Covenant and uh, Ron Wyatt's statement, which seemed really phasma uh, phantasmagorical at the time, where he said there were angels surrounding it, and they t and then he went back uh, to see it again, and it was gone. But before it disappeared, he I think he saw it two or three times, and he left the VHS tape he shot of it in the chamber with it because it wasn't time to show humanity what this looked like. But he said that they told him that the Ark wouldn't be revealed again until the time of the Mark of the Beast, which that was really interesting to me. And the fact that he couldn't find it again himself brought great credibility to me in what he said because I've had this experience firsthand with this implant that disappeared. So I've seen it happen and filmed it. I have firsthand experience with that. So we're looking at very, very short times here between the time when all money goes electronic and where we 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 merge from credit cards to chips, to where the Ark of the Covenant is revealed to the world that this was not a myth, the Exodus did really occur, and here's what the Ark looked like. That's I tend to think that that could be a very real comment that he made. I think we need to get this message out there and we've got to sound the alarm we're not a group of alarmists here we're, we're we're sounding the alarm people need to wake up to the reality of what's coming 
Um, like we think of the, the parable the Wheaton says, um, when you and I were in Oklahoma City, we, we were doing uh, uh, prophecy watches together and I spoke on that because um, scholars didn't understand. They didn't know about artificial intelligence when we just thought, well, there's you know, be good people and bad people blended together. Now we know the synthetic people, there's all kinds of other, you know, artificial intelligence that's walking around, robotic things that are going to play into that end time game. Um, I think we really need to um, make our peace with God. Maybe you're watching this program and you're going, this is really scary stuff. Well, prophecy isn't the scare you to prepare you. Um, right. And I, it, Brandon, would you be so kind? I mean, there might be somebody watching right now. I'm sure at least somebody out there needs to make the peace with God. Would you be so kind? Bring them now to before the, the Lord's throne of mercy, grace, and love. Absolutely. I'd be honored, brother. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and we just want to thank you for the opportunity you've given us tonight, Lord, just to um, do our very best to speak some truth, Lord, to try to uh, expose the uh, the agenda of the day, Lord, of the enemy, uh, the way that he is trying to deceive uh, exactly what you told us would happen in the end times, that the deception would be so great that even the very elect would be deceived if that were possible the words of Jesus. And so, Father, I just pray right now for someone that's watching this that, that maybe they are scared and uh, by things that have been said or revealed uh, to them tonight. Lord, I just want to pray right now over them. Second Timothy 1, 7, your word says, you've not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of soundness of mind, Lord. And I just pray that you will just, uh, just remind us that we have nothing to fear Lord, if we are a child of God, if we are if we are blood bought, uh, if we are saved and born again, then we have nothing to fear, Lord. And so, Father, I just pray for anyone that's listening that 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 maybe they've never done that, that they've never called on the name of Jesus, they've never professed that name, Lord. And and that tonight, today is the day that they uh, that you have drawn them in, Lord, and that, that they want to do that right now. Lord, I just pray uh, your word over them that says if we will confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive, to forgive us of those sins. And your word says that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and then believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. And that all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so, Lord, I just pray right now for that one, Lord, that they would call on the name of Jesus, that they would cry out to that name like never before, that they would begin that process of surrender, of of, of surrendering their life uh, to you, of, of becoming that new creation. That old man is dead, Lord, and that, that new things have come. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. Your word tells us that it is by grace that we have been saved through faith, through faith, so that no, so that none of us could boast about our works, Lord. Thank you for your grace. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, Almighty name. Amen. If um, you just prayed that prayer, you rededicated your life, or this is the first time you did that, let us know about it. You can contact us through the upperroomfellowship.org and Redeem Ministries, talk and, and um, you know, I pray as well right now, because just finding out how much God truly loves you, then you understand how much God loves everybody else, including all the people that frustrate you, that you're upset with, and all the rest of it. Um, it means that none of the criticisms or a spirit of anger or gossip or misunderstandings can change the, the love that we have for you and the love that Christ has for you, and because that's his word, um, rather, you know, his word's going to change us. So we just thank you, Father God, that we can meditate on your word day and night. And it does bring healing. It shall bring healing to, to all our body. We praise your holy name. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, right now that we just speak there to out, calling things as not as if they are. No matter what you're struggling with, if there's some kind of uh, schism in your body, some spirit of affirmity that's trying to mess with you, we just command that thing to go. In Jesus Christ, the Nazareth Almighty name, Yeshua, Messiah Yeshua. Thank you, Lord. Um, the same power that raised him from the dead resides inside every true Christian. So we just proclaim and declare health right now. Um, your healing virtue be released from heaven. I, I speak um, healing and restoration to lungs, um, the, the act normal, continue the, the function normally the way God designed you. 
um, I speak divine healing into hearts and clogged arteries and any heart defect, AFib, or any electronical, um, electrical abnormalities. Uh, abnormalities. Um, be normal now. Be the way God designed you. We speak healing to any spirits uh, behind um, bipolarism or uh, spirits of infirmity behind Parkinson disease or uh, family tremors. We speak health and life into that. We thank you, Father God, anyone suffering from uh, dementia, uh, we just command all those unclean spirits um, the, the go. Any dumb, deaf and dumb spirits, go in Jesus' almighty name that you be healed now. Um, spirits of blindness, uh, that your eyes would work and function the way God designed them to, to function. Um, lungs and hearts, arms and legs, and hands and feet, backs and necks, all the parts of your heads. In the Almighty Word, God overtake you now. Um, healing be released and restoration happen in your, your, your family and your, your businesses and your marriages. In the Almighty name of Jesus, we just thank you, Father God, for broken bones to be mended supernaturally. All cancer to disappear, all the bodies, all diseases to, to vanish, all the people's bodies. In the Almighty name of Jesus, Amen and Hallelujah. In the Almighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Casper. Richard, how can people get in touch with you? Um, they can go to, uh, I have two websites. One is pinlight.com, P-I-N-L-I-G-H-T.com, and the other is endtodarkness.com. The endtodarkness.com is all about the Torah codes and the Trump codes and the, the Comey and Hillary codes that we have. And I keep getting more new ones. Uh, Rabbi Glazerson called me this morning and told me he's going to be in town tomorrow. So we always get together when he's here, you know, and he shows me his latest tables. And uh, I'm also working on a, I have three projects that I'm trying to do. It's a matter of mostly raising the money for them. I've spent a lot of my own time and effort on these projects. One is a, a UFO film. I must have at least 400 clips of UFOs. From all over the world, and when you and it just takes forever categorizing all of them into groups of types of UFOs and what they do. But but once you see uh, this collection of and you you look at them back to back, you can start seeing a pattern emerging, which I think is kind of interesting. Well, we just thank the Lord right now for providing all things that you need to produce these films that. The sound the alarm in the almighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, and and one other thing is that we're also trying to, to get a film done about the near-death experience, and it could have a 100 episodes, essentially, because we have so much material. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Long is behind it, and all these people that have had these experiences, we would uh, reenact their experiences, and we would do it the right way. I mean, it wouldn't look just like blurry wedding videos, like what most of them look like now. But, you know, if they're in Vietnam and their leg gets shot off, we'll make it look like the real thing so that people so will here's, get here's the deal. If Every single American right now would just send $5 to Richard's campaign. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have all the resources to do the films. Okay? Well, at, you know, I was talking to Bob, and I mean, he's working with a guy now. I mean, they're they're working on a series where uh, each episode it's a forty-two minute uh, episode for the series. Each one of those episodes has a five million dollar budget. Uh, the demo to sell the idea to the networks cost a million dollars. Yeah, so well. It, Essentially, we're we're way outclassed by the world and the money that they have available to them. But we know, too, like they don't want to show this stuff. So that means we have to find our own methods of distribution. But we have ideas for that. It's not like we're, you know, void of being able to, to do that kind of thing. It, it just it just costs money. So, you know, just pray that God would break shake loose some real funds to do movies that are, are really great and we got the people that know how to do them. Well, it tells us we're two or more gathered in his name and there's more than two here. We're going to just trust God that he will provide for what you need. And I'm looking forward, not only those films, but you coming back on, sharing the testimony, how God provided. We're going to have to oh, go. thanks. See everybody next time for another spiritual counter. Thanks for the extra time. God bless you all.
Spiritual Encounters with Casper McLeod is a production of the Upper Room Fellowship and Casper McLeod Ministries. Visit us at theupperroomfellowship.org. This program is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 4.0 international license. The intro and outro music is performed by Casper McLeod from his album, Communion, available at theupperroomfellowship.org. In my face, since I learned to pray.